hello, my name is Liz Seaton and I am a curator at the Mariana Kistler Beach Museum of Art at Kansas State University. Welcome to this talk organized in conjunction with the museum's exhibition, Wayland Gregory, Art Deco Ceramics and the Atomic Impulse. The exhibition launched last fall. It was co-curated by independent scholar, Tom Polk and myself. It expands on an exhibition organized by Polk and Wayne Higby of the Alfred Ceramic Art Museum at Alfred University. To see the virtual exhibition, and I encourage you to do so, go to the web, search Beach Museum of Art, click Explore and Exhibitions. Let me tell you a little bit about Wayland Gregory before we get started with the talk. He was a native of Baxter Springs, Kansas. He became a versatile and prolific ceramicist during the period between World War I and World War II and for several decades after. He distinguished himself in many areas of ceramic art, including production pottery, pottery produced in multiples, which we will hear about today, uh, studio pottery, and monumental public sculpture. Gregory's work might be characterized as alternately elegant, playful and attuned to popular culture and social justice issues, sometimes a combination of these things. He was an extremely interesting figure who had a lot to express through his work. And again, I hope you will explore, explore the virtual exhibition, which is the first retrospective of the artist developed by a Kansas art museum. So we are fortunate this evening to have Greg Hatch from his home in Ohio to tell us more about Gregory's work as a designer of production pottery at Cowan Pottery Studio in Rocky River, Ohio. I'll introduce Greg more fully in just a moment. But first I wanna lay out some things. The program will last about 50 minutes. It is being recorded and will be available for later viewing on the museum's YouTube channel. If you'd like to pose a question or comment, please do so using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And closed captioning is available for those who would like it. Click on CC at the bottom of your screen. Okay. Well, let's begin with an acknowledgement that the museum and university stand on the homeland of native peoples and that this land was taken from them by violence and broken promises. This is part of the history of this university and we think it's important to recognize it. So let me formally introduce our speaker. Greg Hatch has served Perhaps we should get Greg on the screen first. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Greg Hatch has served as curator of the Rocky River Public Library's Cowan Pottery Museum in Ohio since 2018. Hatch began his curatorial career at Kent State University, where he earned his bachelor's degree in art history and a master's degree in library science. He then went on to earn a master of fine arts degree in sculpture from Ohio University where he also gained experience as a museum educator. Hatch's personal and professional research has focused on the history of craft, industry, and the communities that develop therein. Thank you for being here, Greg. And we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much for having me, Liz, and thank you to the Beach Museum for having me. So, Good evening, everybody. Um, as mentioned, my name is Greg Hatch, and I am the curator and historian here at Rocky River Public Library and the Cowan Pottery Museum. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into the presentation here. I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen, and then we'll get started. So it didn't start as the Cowan Pottery Studio. It actually started as the Cleveland Pottery and Tile Company which opened in 1913 um, in Lakewood, Ohio, which is just a little bit west of Cleveland. Now, it was actually started through the support of patrons of Cowan who so believed in his work. And you can see one of his early pieces here, um, which was around 1913 here. And you can see that at this time, Cowan was very much focused on uh, pottery, um, not so much the ceramic sculpture that we would see later from him and eventually also Waylon Gregory when he joined the studio, but very much decorative and functional pieces. And as the title um, of the company does imply, they did also, of course, focus on uh, production tile. 
So he had a lot of early success. Um, he got a lot of press. This is actually right after he opened the studio um, in the Plain Dealer in 1913. And this was literally a full page um, spread on Cowan and the new studio. And you can see a lot of actually the forms um, highlighted here that the studio and Cowan would be known for. Um, you can see over here we have tiles, and we also have flower frogs. Now, flower frogs are sculptural um, elements that sit in vase bowls and are the structure um, for flower arrangements. And that was a very, very important object in the history of the studio. And we'll have some photos a little bit later on that will show actually how they were used. Now, um, as I mentioned, they had a lot of early success and another thing that became evident really early on was Cowan's interest in collaboration. And not so much just with other artists um, who were working in ceramic. I'm actually going to go back. Um, we actually have this piece down here, this uh, flower frog, was designed by Walter Sins, who was a fellow uh, ceramic um, and sculptor artists here in Cleveland, as well as a colleague at, at the uh, Cleveland School, which later become the Cleveland Institute of Art. But Cowan was also very much interested in collaborating with other uh, professionals in different mediums. Here on the left, we have a mustard jar. And this mustard jar was a collaboration between Argy Cowan and Horace Potter. Um, Horace Potter was from the Potter and Mellon uh, Jewelry Company. And his contribution to this design was this silver lid, which actually this bead here, as well as the spoon, is actually carved ivory. So again, you see um, sort of a few things that really became um, hallmarks of Cowan and the studio, which was collaboration, production, as well as unique objects and um, sculptural objects that will live in the home. The other thing that um, was a very early success was the studio had public commissions. And this article highlights actually a tile commission for the outside of the facade of the Fourth Church of Christ, scientists rising in um, East End, which is on the uh, east side of Cleveland. And that would be something that would later come up. Um, I will mention that the tile production was primarily during the Lakewood years that we see here, but it does see a resurgence as well as a connection to Whalen Gregory later on. So, um, so the studio did close in 1917. Um, this was actually due to Cowan um, enlisting in the army and fighting in World War I. Um, he was actually in the uh, chemical department. Um, his background as a ceramicist and also um, his education um, really gave him the uh, knowledge and background. And when his um, term of service did end in 1919 and he came back to North, Northeast Ohio, he actually found that his uh, studio in Lakewood, the natural gas well, well had um, actually dried up, which was what was actually used to power all of the kilns. And without that natural resource, unfortunately, it made having that studio at that uh, location impossible. So he, set out to actually reopen the studio and find a new location. And that's when he came to Rocky River, which is pretty much the next town over from Lakewood heading west. Um, and he opened on Lake Road. And very much immediately, he returned to production. We see actually here um, an ad that was placed in 1920 um, for uh, help. So when he was in Lakewood, primarily the production was, um, was Cowan. He was the one producing many of the pieces. He wasn't at the scale that we would see in Rocky River um, while at Lakewood. Um, he did have some employees, but not to the extent that we are going to actually see. Um, now, this later on led to actually some artistic and commercial success. Um, in 1925, he um, actually 
won in ceramic pottery category at the May Show, which was an annual show at the Cleveland Museum of Art of local um, artisans and artists and craftsmen. And his design here of this flower frog is actually what won. Now, as I mentioned, this flower frog, um, the flowers would actually be placed in holes in the base here and actually provide a sculptural element to flower arrangements. And this design was so popular that he actually filed a patent. Um, he filed a patent for his design because also it did get copied a great deal. And he actually did have a, a few companies that he did uh, go after in the courts uh, for copying his design. Um, also, this led to him actually developing, again, that relationship with other artists um, and started producing limited edition uh, sculptural objects for the homes. And these two pieces by um, Alexander uh, Blazes um, are examples of that. You know, we started seeing here um, an attempt to not only have functional pieces that had um, a purpose like um, the vases, the flower frogs, the mustard jar, but actually having pieces that were meant to be uh, sculptural objects uh, to live within and throughout the home. Um, also during all of this time and really throughout Cowan's career, um, there was a lot of uh, glaze experimentation. Um, as I mentioned with his education, um, he really um, loved and, uh, to explore what glazes and color could do within ceramics and within pottery. Uh, this piece here um, actually has a wonderful iridescent surface. Um, here, of course, it's frozen in a photo, but when you're in person, uh, very much like um, oil on water, it actually has a rainbow sheen that uh, shifts as you walk by it. Uh, the other thing that he would do would invite artists who would not work with in ceramics. So we actually have this piece here that was designed by Paul Manship. Uh, Paul Manship is, of course, well, more well known for his bronzes. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with his work, uh, one of his famous pieces, of course, being the uh, uh, golden figure at the Rockefeller ice rink. Uh, so if you're a fan of 30 Rock, uh, you probably have seen it. Um, and this piece here is actually a uh, ceramic. And to at least my knowledge, um, this was the only kind of ceramic piece that we actually would see out of um, Paul Manchev, his designs ending up again in bronze. And this would be something that Cowan um, would kind of continue to do, would be uh, invite sculptors who had experience in other mediums to come and make limited edition ceramics. Um, another example of that is Margaret Postgate, um, who actually was a artist who would carve her sculptures out of soap and then send them uh, to Cowan and he would cast them in ceramics. So Throughout this all, it led to a huge expansion. We have this wonderful map here pro uh, produced by Tom Barrett, um, which shows um, by 1928 or so um, how much the um, area had really grown. And you can kind of see that, you know, beyond just having um, himself and, you know, one or two employees, you know, it really had kind of expanded out to having a full um, production of and a very large company. Uh, the other thing is that they developed new technologies to uh, keep up with all of the production demands. We can actually see here um, one of the employees, uh, George uh, Brunt here in the center, um, and Ray uh, taught uh, here in the background, um, using an aerosol gun. And this was actually an aerosol gun that Cowan developed with technicians from the automotive industry in Detroit to actually spray glaze, which was a very much new technology, but it made obviously production a lot faster because you're able to apply a surface more evenly and, and quickly um, using this technique. 
Um, also, the other thing that you would see is that Cowan was very much expanding into the market. He would actually have demonstrations in department stores um, where he would have his um, employees and artists go in, and this is at Halley's department store, and actually show how these pieces were done to show the crafts, the craftsmanship, to show the um, the the art of actually creating these objects. And one actually very fun note is that this artist right here is Elizabeth Anderson, um, who eventually would have uh, the surname of Ness. She would eventually marry Elliot Ness. Um, so this just kind of a fun or a little bit of a side. Um, and then also there was a, um, very much a, how the pieces were marketed. Big thing with Cowan was that these were limited edition pieces. He would limit how many pieces were produced at the studio. Because of them being slipcast, of course, there is a ability to create more and more. But by making it a smaller run, uh, they pushed it more into a luxury market. And you can see here on this window display very much how they saw how these pieces would live in the house. And as I mentioned, it very much grew um, to over 30 employees. Um, we have, this is actually not even all the employees um, at that time or artists who would work up there. Uh, Cowan also had uh, his students um, from the Cleveland Institute of Art come and work at the studio who are not pictured. So this kind of takes us up to, like I said, about 1928 and to Wailing Gregory. So um, here is a very, very early picture of Will and Gregory. Um, it is undated. Um, we can get a little bit of sense of when this was taken because um, the studio was in uh, Pittsburgh, Kansas. Um, so probably relatively um, quite young, probably not even 20 yet. Uh, there have been some wonderful uh, presentations in the series that have talked about Will and Gregory and his full career. I am going to kind of speed ahead actually to right before he uh, arrived at Cowan. And here we actually have the travel log um, that was located on Ancestry.com of Will and Gregory's trip to Europe with TAP right prior to going to Cowan's studio. So it's, it's really quite interesting because we actually can actually see that um, this trip that he took um, to Europe um, right before going to Cowan, uh, he left in about the July 8th and he um, came back around um, September 18th. Sorry, the uh, screens had cut off mine a little bit there. I do apologize. Um, so it's quite interesting because, you know, this was only a, a few month trip, but this trip had such an effect on his um, artistic outlook, his way of looking at the art, at form, and the way of looking at his own work. So right about that time, about 1928, is when Whalen Gregory actually came over to Cowan. And it's not really sure how Cowan met Whalen Gregory. Um, there is some speculation that when Cowan was visiting Chicago, which is where William Gregory was at that time, um, there may have been interaction. There may have been interaction between William Gregory's then mentor, uh, Taft and Cowan. Um, not really completely sure, but eventually it did lead to, Will, uh, to Cowan actually inviting William Gregory to come out to Cleveland and being um, one of uh, the studio's full-time employees. And these are kind of examples of works that he produced right at the time of his arrival to Cleveland. Though it's quite interesting, through the scholarship of Mark Bassett and Victoria Newman, um, the piece on the left here, um, which is a lamp base, actually may have been produced while uh, William Gregory was 
in Chicago because there's a photo that says uh, Midway Studios, and this is cited in uh, Bassett's book, um, uh, that would imply that this was actually designed um, while Wellingbury was in Chicago at Midway Studios and the design sent over to Cleveland for mass production. Um, the other piece that we see on the right here, now this photo is from 1931, but the sculpture was one of the first pieces that uh, William Gregory made when he arrived in Cleveland, and it actually is a bronze, and this is um, entitled Dionysus, um, and this was from a future exhibit that he would have at the Milwaukee um, Art Institute. And you can really see even just at the beginning, then the variety of different styles that Will and Gregory um, would go between. You know, the one thing that you see throughout Will and Gregory's career is just a huge spectrum of aesthetics and skills and uh, characteristics in his sculptures that would um, be simultaneously. It's, it wasn't really uh, development from like, a one style to another, but one's actually going parallel to each other. And so one of the first pieces that Will and Gregory designed for the Cowan Pottery Studio was uh, this sculpture. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Cowan was very much interested in the idea of getting into limited edition sculptures for the home. So we have here Margarita, and this is our uh, copy that we have here in our museum. And this is actually an ad for the, um, what was I gonna say, for the sculptures in the, the dealer's catalogs. These would be catalogs they would actually send to um, different department stores, to interior designers, to buyers, to, you know, to solicit sales. And this was how they very much did sell Cowan. And you can see here, again, you have that repeated theme of this being only a limited edition of 50. Uh, one thing to note, so price listed for 75. Roughly for this time, every dollar is $15 to kind of get perspective of uh, price. So this was not an inexpensive item. It definitely was on that higher end of a market because, you know, you're looking at this being about a thousand dollars retail. Well, not retail. I'm sorry, wholesale because this is the dealer's catalog. So then, of course, it would have a markup in the retail setting. And you can see here that you know this. Um, sculpture was already a great success because it had actually been designed that was entered into that same May show that uh, Cowan had actually um, won with his flower frog um, back in 1925. The big difference actually being was that this was actually part of a new category that kind of developed um, with the entries that were presented by the Cowan Studio, as well as other artists here in the area. So you would see uh, back in 1925, it was ceramic pottery. Um, and then in 1928 and then 2029, we had the categories of ceramic sculpture. Again, recognizing that this is, uh, you know, the different medium between uh, the functional work and the piece that's meant to have a sculptural life within the home. And it's actually noted here about its winning. And then, um, you know, the other thing that we would see a lot is, um, you know, they very much marketed Will and Gregory. That was one thing that they promoted that you're going to see again and again in these ads was, you know, they have, um, you know, this has not been in a national sculpture um, exhibition, but it's going to be, you know, kind of implying that, you know, this was a upward trajectory. The other pieces that Will and Gregory actually um, had accepted to the show were these two production pieces that we see here, which this was a shell ashtray and this was a bud vase. So kind of right off the bat, you have Will and Gregory not only doing the sculpture work, but also really getting into that production work. And that being kind of new, you know, if you look at William Gregory's career kind of lean up to that, the idea, idea of doing production ceramics was a little bit more new to him. 
And I think that the one thing that really helped him kind of ease into that is the fact that um, Will, um, that Cowan actually employed the slip casting technique, which, um, like I said, I do encourage you to check out the other talks in this series because there's a wonderful talk uh, from November that you know goes into the slip casting uh, series. Um, and the other thing I noticed is that as much as Cowan and Wayne Gurry were having an effect on um, you know, the May show and having that, you know, new category come up. I always like to actually like see that the effect that that exhibition and seeing the work of other individuals had a effect on their body of work. So on the right here from the Cleveland Museum of Arts May show records, we actually have the 1927 poster. And in it, we see this again, the motif of Diana and the fawns um, here in the silhouette but then we see it repeated here in this 1929 um, catalog. And it should be noted that this was actually put in to the uh, 1929 May show um, and did win. And this would have been very early on. Again, we, we kind of have the idea that, you know, uh, William Gurry got back to the States in around September, 1928. And then he came to Cleveland in around December 1928. And the May show would have been already installed literally in May of 1929. So he produced this with in less than six months of him actually being within the, um, the area. The other effect that um, was a kind of an early muse, if you will, uh, would be this uh, actress and performer, uh, Gilda Gray, uh, which we do have a signed promotional um, photo here from the Whalen Gregory archives. And in it, it does say uh, to my favorite sculptor, um, which obviously she had very high esteem. Um, and, you know, Gilda Gray um, had been known very much uh, for her particular, particular style of dance and for the type of um, act that she was doing. Um, and those stylistic um, attributes are really translated to the sculptures that Will and Gregory would produce for, um, based on her. Now, the interesting thing that I found in this Plain Dealer article, by the way, I probably should mention the Plain Dealer is our local newspaper. But this Plain Dealer article from 1929, again, very early from when he first came to Cleveland, um, this article seems to imply that Waylon Gregory was actually producing and modeling clay sketches based on Gilda Gray, um, actually in the dressing room. This is an article from a reporter who was doing a profile on the life of individuals in the theater. And you can see here, we wound our um, visit with a visit to the dressing room of Gilda Gray, who was posing for young sculptor uh, William Gregory. Um, Gilda will be fired and appear again as a piece of ceramic sculpture. As soon as Mr. Gregory has completed the figure, he will make from his clay sketches. So I think it's really interesting that this sort of does imply that he wasn't producing sketches and designs on paper that he would be taking back and designing sculptural pieces out of. He actually was taking clay to the theater and actually modeling pieces that he would then take back to the studio and finish the actual piece. And the sculptures that we got from it were these two that we have here. And this is another promotional photo that was part of the Whalen Gregory archive. And this is not the costume that um, these pieces are uh, based on, but I do think that the geometric and very much the style of the costumes of the time very much translated into these pieces. That geometric, um, the blocking, the blocking, um, the idea of a more fitted uh, blouse and a more full skirt. Um, these are kind of themes that we see even within this costume um, being within the figures. Um, the other thing that Waylon Gregory got to do um, very quickly um, is he was um, involved 
again, in that sort of way that Cowan was marketed. So he was one of the artists who would go and go to Halley's department store in downtown Cleveland, and he would demonstrate um, his skill. And um, uh, you can see here in this article from the Plain Dealer, um, they mentioned the Margarita sculpture, um, as well as the Salome sculpture, um, as and the fawns. He was very, very, very well known when he was in Cleveland for the spawn figures. And we have a, a stage promotional photo of him actually working on the Diana and Fawn um, figures here. And you can see that, you know, these would have, um, you very much see it's a stage photo because of course he is in a full suit working on ceramics, but um, you can see actually the uh, textural and sheen difference of these pieces um, being clay um, and, not being fired. They obviously have a different appearance in the photo than the pieces that we see in the back here. Um, and just like how they staged the photos for the, dis the window display, um, they very much highlighted Will and Gregory's work. We see the um, Margarita sculpture over here. We actually see his torso sculpture over here. Um, this is actually a piece by Margaret Postgate, who was the artist who actually sculpted out of soap. But you would see how these were presented as being sculptural objects for your home. It was very much designed for a particular market. Though you did have the pieces back here of the flower frogs that had more of a practical or functional design, you know, the ones to the forefront, the ones that are being highlighted and placed on these, you know, velvet drapes are these more, um, sculptural and larger objects. And as I mentioned though, along doing these limited edition and sculptural pieces, Will and Gregory was involved in the production. And we can see down here actually some of the um, vases and also lamp bases that Will and Gregory, um, which is commonly known as the scroll vase which I think is very interesting um, because there actually are three animals on it. There is a herring, a squirrel, and a pheasant. Um, but you actually can see this was another very common thing that we would see at the Cowan Pottery Studio was that they would uh, take a base form and then use it in multiple different ways. So you see it over on the right here being used as a vase. And then over on the left, it actually was a lamp base. Down here is actually the electrical cord and the hardware for the actual lamp would have come out of the top here. Also, you can see the different ways that, you know, these things came in so many different colors. Uh, this piece is also in the exhibition online um, and it's in more of a kind of a caramel color. And here we have it in a shadow white and here in these blue tones. Um, here, actually, you can see the pheasant. This is actually how it was presented in the, um, oh, what's the word, uh, in the dealer's catalog. And again, as I mentioned before, they really marketed Will and Gregory's skill as a sculptor. Um, and the fact that they, you know, here, I'm going to go ahead and move my screen so I can fully read that. You know, Will and Gregory was uh, responsible for the beautiful relief decoration. The same talent for modeling imaginative animal figures has now been turned to the relief on vases and other pottery. So again, it's that sort of introduction to pottery and vessels um, being first kind of that surf design on these base forms that Cowan is producing. Um, and then eventually also producing and um, manufacturing his own designs um, in vases and pottery. Um, the other type of work that he created and another style, which has such a um, kind of a cartoonish appearance are these bookend slash decanters. Now for a little bit of context, this is 1930. So this is during the time of prohibition. Uh, so these are bookends that are also double as decanters. Um, and this is how they were advertised. And this is an advertisement from the dealer's catalog from 1930. Um, as they say here in the text, it was based on the Alice in Wonderland. And the one thing to note is the books they chose for these bookends that were also decanters, which is um, The Inside of Prohibition, um, 
the ABCs of prohibition and drink. So they very much are implying, though not explicitly saying that, yes, these are also decanters and they do have that double purpose. Um, so you can see um, very much again, a tongue in cheek approach towards marketing uh, these objects. The other thing that you'll see here is that these figures here are of course in this matte black with the gold trim and these in the solid white. And then also they would come um, in a polychrome where they were then hand painted. Uh, and as I mentioned before, uh, he did also eventually get into producing his own designs um, for vessels, for uh, pottery, for uh, some of these uh, more functional pieces um, going away from the more sculptural ones. And here you can see actually the hair, uh, the uh, flamingo design that he actually produced as a flower frog, um, as well as a sculptural object. And this is how it was, again, you kind of see, again, this marketing of William Gregory's skills as a sculptor. Um, and then also you see um, how they were presenting this as affordable art for your home. Um, you know, the fact that they're saying like we could charge $50, but we're only offering it for 15, which by the way, in context, $15 back then versus today is roughly around 200. So still a pretty high price, but they're saying it's a much more reasonable price. Um, and here we would see again those repeated figures of the fawns and the deer and the stag and those very animated figures. You know, he was very well known for animals and uh, those kind of sculptural forms while um, at Cowan. Um, and also his figures, you know, um, as we saw kind of right off the bat, he very much produced figural work that had a sculptural and functional presence uh, throughout the Cowan line. Uh, these are also quite interesting because these are uh, lamp bases. Um, it's believed that these may have been designed um, for children's bedrooms. Uh, we have the kind of the cat and the dog design, very much more in a geometric abstracted design. Um, as well as producing these sort of sets, um, which is a combination bookend and also paperweight, but it has a delightful humorative narrative. Um, as sort of seen here, it kind of turns your desk and these kind of functional objects to be in a very playful, um, you know, narrative of riders being thrown from their horses. Um, and you can also see at this base here, uh, Waylon Gregory, his signature, which the one thing to really note is they didn't mention always all the artists in those dealer catalogs. You know, you know, so again, the fact that they were very much promoting Waylon Gregory um, and all of his sculptural skills during this time um, and marketing them um, to their uh, buyers. Um, and as I mentioned before, these were slip cast produced pieces. And we can see here, this is the, um, the bust sculpture we have here on the left, um, here still in its mold, which I always admit, I'm always surprised that this is only a two part mold that they were able to do just because of how much detail this piece actually does have. Um, but you can see an, um, a worker here pouring slip this liquid clay into this plaster mold, um, which is gonna seep away all of the moisture leaving only the clay behind. So even though they could produce in much higher volumes, again, they very much reduced and um, controlled the volume that any of these uh, per, uh, pieces were actually produced at. Um, the other thing that I just want to mention um, is that he did also do a little bit of tile design. This is Knowledge and Industry, which is a mosaic tile um, mural, which 
eventually would be installed at Lakewood High School. And again, kind of to refer back, Lakewood was the original uh, location of Cowan Studio. Um, unfortunately, it's not known right now the location of these tile murals, um, but we do have this wonderful photo from the Cleveland Museum of Arts um, archives that show what these designs uh, look like. Um, the other thing that Will and Gregory um, very much got into was doing more large sculptures towards the end. And we have the Lita and Swan here in the background of this photo. And then in this photo here from um, actually his cram book days where he went afterwards after Cowan, uh, we can kind of see its full kind of scale. Um, and this, um, we actually see that it was unglazed. And then this one, it actually got more of a finish. And just kind of to wrap up his sort of time in, in Cowan, he had, again, such a spectrum of different styles. You had the geometric form on the right and the more sort of Art Nouveau, um, more um, depictive style on the left. And again, these were being produced simultaneously. I think that's something that you would also see um, future on in William Gregory's career was being able to produce two bodies of work where the styles are very different um, at the same time, available to kind of switch on and off between them. Um, the other thing that happened is he met his wife while here. Um, we actually have the marriage certificate here. Um, he was married in 1930. And on April 8th, if, if you're curious, that's when his uh, wedding uh, anniversary would be. Um, so this is his wife, uh, uh, Yulandi uh, Von Wagner, and they were married by Justice of the Peace. And you can see actually here, uh, they made the social pages. So this is actually their wedding announcement the next day in the Plain Viewer. Now, the one thing to sort of uh, mention is that Whalen Gregory came towards more the end of the Cowan um, studio timeline. In 1931, um, after the crash of the stock market, um, economic times did force the studio to close, unfortunately. Um, so it wasn't official for um, a good part of it, but in 1931, December, Cowan did actually file and um, went to bankruptcy and officially kind of shuttling, uh, shutting down in 1932. And so when the studio shut down, Waylon Gregory um, did actually go over to uh, Cranbrook. And we see here in this Plain Deer article that his absence was noted by the local press. Um, we actually have this actually highlight of him packing away his objects um, and about him um, and the amazing opportunity of his fellowship that he would be starting at Cranbrook. And we actually have this photo, which would have been probably from the same photo shoot um, in the Whalen Gregory archives and you can actually see um, some of the works that weren't the production pieces that they were producing at Cowan. Though it should be noted that this design, this large sculpture, did actually show up as a small lamp, this exact design, um, in the Cowan line. Um, not to this scale. Um, it's quite interesting because it almost looks like from this photo that this was actually carved stone. So it is also that, a very interesting idea to think that he was working in one medium and then translating it to the ceramic mass production um, at the studio. And a few things I kind of want to highlight of the effects his time at Cowan had on Waylon Gregory's style and his career. You see here again that um, use of the sculpture um, of the head um, being seen again and again. We actually have one of the few non-Cowan Wayungari pieces in our collection here over on the right. Um, and this was one that he would make actually after his cram book time. Uh, the other thing was that, uh, you know, you saw the legacy of that production studio. Later on in Waylon Gregory's career, he would return to a production uh, line and he actually reissued this sculpture um, at that time. Um, 
and I think it's really interesting because it really is just very much the same sculpture, except that it has actually gold details on it. Uh, the other thing that I also like to think about is the fact that, you know, there were a lot of horses. He, he designed a lot of horses while at, well, at, uh, at Cowan, and you can see the uh, sculptural um, investigation of the, the horse form uh, that would eventually translate into his uh, Kansas Madonna sculpture. Uh, the other thing, this is actually my one of my favorite pieces in the collection that we have, um, is this is a lamp designed by Will and Gregory. And the individuals who donated this piece said that they got it actually from the Whalen Gregory estate. And the interesting thing about this piece is that it is a mistake. What you see, this drip, is actually what happens when glaze residue or glazes from another piece do not heat properly in the kiln and melt onto the pieces below. And you actually can see that it becomes this glass-like material. And the fact that it may have came from the Whalen Gregory estate, I like to believe that this was maybe possibly an inspiration for that experimentation of glass and ceramics that he would later patent, just like Cowan Pottery um, patent their designs um, later on, um, his geode um, forms. So I do want to encourage, uh, here's a short list of some work cited um, for this uh, talk. And I also just want to thank, you know, all of the work of all the processors who have been in my position as curator over the years of uh, the museum, as well as all the scholars who have, done, who have um, contributed to our archive, uh, because it's really through their research and their efforts and um, that we have so much of this information. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Greg. That's a much fuller picture of Gregory's time at Cowan for me now. Thank you. And I love the images. Wonderful. There was a time um, we're now, if you would like to ask Greg a question, um, please uh, go ahead and write it in the Q&A. Uh, press the Q&A button, write it in the box, and we'll try to get to it. Um, while we're waiting, I might ask you about one of the images you showed uh, the casting process, when you said that was only a two mold process for that particular work, is that what, right? What did you mean by that exactly? So with the plaster cast, um, with the slip cast, the molds have to be broken up into different segments to be taken apart to release the ceramic form. And the more complicated the form, the more undercuts that you would see in the sculpture, the actually more device you have to have. Because if you don't have them, there's no way to release it. So think of an elephant sculpture. If the elephant's trunk is going forward and down, unless you have the two-part mold going from side to side, if you had it going this way, you wouldn't be able to release it from the mold because just like a teacup, you would have that kind of hole in the middle missing and it would not be able to come apart. So the more complicated the design, the more um, pieces that are going to be needed for it. Um, so so I would. Have... Oh, oh, sorry. So then you have more seams that have to be trimmed. Is that right? Am I getting that oh, right? Okay. Yes. And then you have people that we, we saw who do the trimming work. I think that was one of the images, which is very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. And it is sort of, and that's the one thing is that, you know, if you see different, um, pieces, two ways to kind of tell if a ceramic piece has been slip casted um, is they're going to be hollow and sometimes they'll still have the seam of the slip cast depending on the kind of the production. I see that my co-curator Tom Folk has raised his hand. Jen, are you able to or am I able to? Yeah. Jen? Well, I will, let's see, I've got a couple of things in the Q&A, let's see. What relationship did Cowan Pottery have to the Cleveland School Artists? This is from Teresa Bentmister, who used to be here as a curator. So, um, you know, the interesting thing is that so many of those artists who were associated with the Cleveland School uh, had either a parallel or sort of a 
close up lives with the with the studio itself. Um, like I sort of mentioned, um, Cowan was an instructor at the Cleveland Institute of Art, the Cleveland School of Art at that time, which is where we get that that sort of name. Um, also, the one thing I didn't mention was one of the artists that came after Will and Gregory arrived um, was one of Cowan's students, uh, which was Victor Schreckengoss, who is a uh, noted Cleveland school. So there were some artists who were involved. Um, it is explored more actually in uh, Mark Bassett and uh, Victoria Newman's book, uh, Cowan Pottery in the Cleveland School. So I definitely encourage uh, that uh, for it's kind of like there, but you'll see actually a lot of parallel, um, what was I gonna say, a lot of parallel names of noted artists who are associated with the Cleveland School and who did work at the studio. Thanks. Tom, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I just wanna say, I recall the big statue uh, that Mr. Uh, that he showed, Mr. Hatch showed, of a of Lita and the Swan, it's a woman, a nude woman with a you know with a, a swan up in her hand. That one, it's in plaster. I remember that was in plaster. It's not stone. It's in plaster. I just remember that. I just thought I would bring it up. That's all. You did a very nice job. Congratulations. <laughs> so if it was plaster, then maybe it was a prelude to a ceramic version. Would be bronze. He was working in bronze too. Bronze. Oh. He probably yeah, so. didn't have the money to do it. That's probably what it was. That's mm -hmm. a cheap way out. Yeah. That's a cheap way to handle the situation. <laughs> well, it, I mean, Tom, that really is is really really interesting. Just be um, the um, oh, what's the word? The Lita and Swan sculpture was one of the 1930s um, piece in the May show. Um, and he listed as an unglazed piece. So it's very interesting to hear that it was plaster and that it was presented in that way. Yeah, I, I read it somewhere. I read it somewhere in some of my, in some of the stuff that it was plastic. Okay. That's very cool. And, and it's much, much lighter to move around too. Yes, yes. <laughs> Can I, I ask you both, one of my questions was to tell us a little bit more about the Gregory archives at the library uh, where you work. Um, and I know, Tom, you have helped in the process of those archives coming to the library. Is that right? Am I getting that right? That, that's right. I, I had them from the estate. I took everything that was left in the estate. It was in my house for five years. And then I donated them to the uh, Helen Pottery Museum. So, uh, you know, it's up to uh, Mr. Hatch to uh, digitize them now. <laughs> and it looks like you've got Great photos. What else? Uh, what are the other kind of strengths of that archive, Greg? I mean, honestly, the the strength of it is the fact that it just covers almost. I, I would say every step of his career, um, within photos, within um, the collection of press of memorabilia from exhibitions. It really shows um, an uh, ephemera sort of timeline of Whalen Gregory's uh, career starting all the way back from his early successes um, in high school. And again, with that context that he graduated high school at such a young age. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very, it was a prodigy really, wasn't it? Here's a comment from Nick, Jim Copless, who you, whose talk you referred to. And he says, hi, Greg, uh, talk last November. Thanks for this exciting lecture. So much great historical information. I'm really interested about your insight into the glaze spray gun. Can we attribute Cowan to the first use of pressurized glaze spray guns? Also, I love that glass piece and totally agree it's a probable contemplation piece and inspired the glass ceramic work. So we can't Fully, just because there's always that sort of many people at the same time were producing similar things. We're actually so lucky because our museum and on display currently, we actually have one of the spray guns that was developed for the studio, um, which for me is actually really, really exciting. I love, <laughs> I love that kind of stuff. Um, and we actually do have a lot of documentation of um, one of uh, Cowan's employees um, 
collaboration with the technicians in Detroit to make something that could spray these kind of glazes, you know, because they very much were producing all of their glazes. And we actually have a few of their glaze notebooks and all of their recipes. So again, for me, I really love that. Um, so to really make sure that you're going to have something that can apply this glaze material in an even way that also is not going to gum up the um, the air spray gun um, often. So it was very interesting to, to kind of see how that kind of developed. I, I wish I could say definitively yes, um, but unfortunately no. Again, there's too many like again parallel individuals uh, producing that same kind of technology at the same time. You know, and I should have mentioned that Nick is uh, the head of the ceramics program here at Kansas State University. Uh, and Mark Bassett, who you've referred to as a scholar of Cowan, um, is here, mm -hmm. and he mentioned the spray gun in the collection, and he also has a question, and that is, uh, I like the observation that many elements of Gregory's later career have some kind of origin or parallel in his Cowan pottery work. Can you say anything about the Cowan fountain, the Rhine maidens, that Waylon Gregory designed? Now, I don't know if those two are connected, but those are, that's the comment in the question. You know, could you repeat the question one more time? I'm so sorry. So uh, the question is, can you say anything about the Cowan Fountain, the Rhine Maidens that Waylon Gregory designed? And I don't know whether he wants to know whether you think that influenced his later work or not, but anyway, that's the question. Well, and, and you know what, that was something that very much kind of developed towards the later end of Waylon um, Gregory and Cowan's sort of relationship. Um, was the development of the larger Rhine main uh, the, um, fountain piece. And it is very interesting because as kind of Cowan went on and towards the end of it, they did start to kind of go into those markets where they were producing again, tile pieces for public um, um, areas. I don't know. I, I, I'm not seeing, it, it is sort of interesting because the, the piece that's being described has a central form. And then we have the two pair forms that are two seahorses that are, go along with actually and, and flank the Rhine Maiden. And it is sort of interesting because there is that sort of forefront to think about the seahorses and thinking about their relationship to the water. Um, I don't know if, and if anyone, by the way, might have more knowledge, um, more knowledge than I on this, if it ever actually got used. And that's why I don't know if it did have effect um, on his, you know, obviously his later attempts, or not attempts, but his later creations of uh, fountain Fountains. work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because as mentioned um, in Nicholas's talk, there's so much that goes on with a public fountain and ceramics. You know, you have water, and the elements, um, especially obviously here in winter, you can see how the elements can affect different materials. Um, so I don't know. Um, the interesting thing though, is that tile form did live above a fountain at the Lakewood High School. Um, so at least for interior fountains, I think there was sort of a, a narrative kind of going on that that work was sort of starting to happen. Um, but I don't know if it ever, translated into the later outdoor fountains. Um, Tom, have you raised your hand again? Jennifer is the one who can, Jen who is assisting us with the tech. Can you hear me to, now? Yeah. yeah, oh, hi. I was just saying that uh, it's his first fountain thing. But the fountain theme is not something he started. He got it from Laredo Taft. Laredo Taft did this fat, huge one in Chicago, outdoor piece uh, that's called The Fountain of Time. And he had used the fountain theme in the Columbian Exposition to Laredo Taft. So he really admired him. And I think he was continuing this theme. For Cowan Pottery, this Rhine Maiden theme is a big one. He did three operatic themes. The other one you mentioned was Margarita from Faust. And Salome from the opera by, you know, by Ricard Strauss. So there are three operatic themes. This is one of them. And then it looks towards the fountain. The next one he did for his apartment in New York City. And, uh, you know, it had the figure of the swimmer in the middle of it. 
And uh, that was his first monumental piece, uh, The Swimmer. And then from then you have Light Dispelling Darkness in New Jersey, which is still there today, and The Water of the World's Fair, which is, uh, you know, uh, Fountain of the Atom. So fountains are a big theme in his work and looks towards the three major fountain themes that happen later on. Also relates to the work of his teacher, Laredo Taft. So I just wanted to put a little bit historical context into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and please do, everyone, go uh, to the exhibition and you'll see some of the things that Tom is mentioning, some of the fountain projects. Um, I have a question that relates to Laredo Taft because I understand he was with Waylon Gregory on that trip to Europe. Mm -hmm. And Joe Miller asks, while in England, do you know where he, who he studied with, where he studied, anything about his travels there? So the only thing I could find was um, actually the uh, ship logs of him actually sailing over and sailing back, um, at least through um, the public records. Um, I do know that his first stay was at a hotel, um, which very much just very much was like, you know, he was just getting there. It was the start of his trip sort of thing. So it doesn't really help with the narrative of who he got to kind of study with. Um, but actually, it's, it's interesting. So the reason we, I was able to confirm that this Whalen Gregory was the right Whalen Gregory was because Taft was um, uh, another passenger on this actual log um, that we were able to see that they uh, traveled together. So they actually did also maintain, um, what was I going to say, they, they had the same trajectory. They, you know, they stayed together the entire trip from the beginning till the end. Taff was, uh, seems like a huge influence on Gregory. Oh, yes. It is 6.33, and we want to be respectful of people's time, so uh, I don't know if I see any more questions in the chat and the question answer box. Is there anybody else who has raised their hand, Jennifer? Okay. Well, I really want to thank you again, Greg. I'm so glad we were able to have you um, representing Cowan's history come and enhance our knowledge of Waylon Gregory's involvement with Cowan. Just really helped fill out our program schedule for this exhibition. So thank you very much. No, thank you so much again for having me, and and thank you to um, to everyone for coming. And, and uh, yeah, thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you, Tom, for coming into the conversation. And it's been wonderful to work with you, Tom. Um, and want to thank Jen Harlan for her assistance with the program, um, the Zoom program. And uh, I guess say take care of yourselves, everyone, and good night.